Welcome to Mechanics of Composite Materials. We'll be discussing classical plate theory. So to really explain what we're trying to do, um, when you're modeling large scale structures, if you were to model it with finite elements, you may have to use 3D elements, which are quite computationally expensive. Say you have the skin of an aircraft, which is fairly thin. Instead of modeling the through thickness direction with a lot of elements, uh, we will model it a little bit differently. What we're gonna do is take the 3D structural representation and idealize it uh, as a surface, okay? And what we're going to do is uh, track the deformation of this plate by following the mid-surface of that plate. And so we've simplified then by doing so a 3D finite, a 3D plate into a 2D surface, which now what you can do is if you were to model the aircraft, you would just model this mid surface and that is representing the 3D behavior of the structure. The question is, how can we do this simplification in a way that's mathematically correct, physically correct? And again, since that's an assumption that we're making, there are going to be some fundamental issues with uh, uh, the equilibrium equations. So classical laminated plate theory, uh, we're going to start with the displacement assumptions, the strains, the stresses, and then we're gonna go into the constitutive law. So these are the areas that we're gonna cover today as far as mechanics of materials. So classical laminated plate theory, what we're trying to do is we're trying to track the mid-surface. This mid-surface um, is going to, uh, you're gonna have some in-plane deformation. So you have here the, deflect, the deflection in the X direction, the deflection in the Y direction, the deflection in the Z direction. And as you can see here, there's a superscript here, which really symbolizes the fact that we're tracking the mid-surface. That's really what we're tracking here. And, and again, tracking the mid-surface um, does not mean that we're not ignoring everything else. We still have to somehow consider the whole plate, okay? And so classical laminated theory, plate theory was um, initiated by a gentleman, gentleman whose uh, name was Kirchhoff. So we also call this theory Kirchhoff plate theory. And the, the idea that we have here is that when a plate undergoes deformation, when a plate goes under, uh, goes under deformation, that the normal to the mid-surface will remain perpendicular to this mid-surface. So in other words, I can deform this plate as much as I want, but this, the normal to the surface will remain perpendicular to the mid-surface, okay? And so, it implies then that the deflections vary linearly through the thickness. So that's one of the assumptions we're making in this theory. So if I were to look at z equals zero, uh, I recover then the deflections at the mid-surface. This mid-surface is at z equals zero, okay? But if I look away to the, towards the top of the plate or bottom of the plate where z equals h half, assuming that the plate is h, then z equals h half is the top surface of the plate, z equals minus h half is the bottom surface of the plate, then the deflections at any point through the thickness of the plate is given as the deflections of the mid-surface, and here you have uh, minus z times these uh, slopes, okay? And while we'll talk more about these slopes, but as you can see, when I put z equals zero, I recover the deflections of the plate at the mid-surface. Anywhere else, what I have here is the contribution of the mid-surface and then uh, a slope times z, okay? Obviously, W here is the through a thickness direction. What we're saying is that doesn't matter where I am, through the thickness of that plate, I'm going to assume that every point through the thickness of, through the thickness of that plate follows the outer plane deflection at the mid-surface. 
So whether I'm on the top of the surface or bottom of the surface, it doesn't matter. The outer plane deflection W will be equal to the deflection on the mid surface of the plate. That assumption makes sense because if you have a thin plate and you deform a, mid pla a, a, a thin plate, you don't expect significant changes to the thickness of that plate. As a consequence, doesn't matter where you are in the thickness of that plate, uh, the deformation through a thickness will be equal to the deformation at the mid surface of the plate. Okay. And so the question is why we arrange the equation in this manner. Okay. And I will explain that a little bit more, but I want you to remind you that the, we're assuming here that when the plate deforms and the plate is thin, that the normal to the mid surface remains normal after deformation. That's a very important assumption uh, that works very well for thin plates. So then the normal to the mid surface remains normal after deformation. That implies that the transverse shear strains are zero. And the reason that is the case is we could, because we just told you that a Z, which is normal to the surface, that that's going to stay perpendicular to the mid surface of the plate, which means that ZX and ZY, that angle is not going to change. Therefore, the strain, which we had discussed previously, these strains are the transverse shear strains. These transverse shear strains are zero. And so when I plug in, um, the, the, the definition of transfer shear strain, that is the derivative of u respect to z plus the der derivative of w respect to x. And what I see here is that the derivative of u respect to z of this equation is really this coefficient here. So that's negative w at the mid surface respect to x. That's what you got there. And then plus the derivative of w respect to x and w we said that it doesn't matter where it was, it's W naught. So therefore, I have this term that goes there. And you can see that it ca automatically cancels out and I give zero. It gives zero. The other transverse shear strain similarly switch X and Y and you, you get the same answer. Um, and what we see here is that we, with this assumption we made, uh, it tends to be a pretty good one because um, this. Uh, the, uh, we're able to show you that um, with these assumptions, we can get this transverse shear strains equal to zero, which is an important assumption. So now let's try to explore to see what is going on with this plate. So let's look at um, back at this plate here, and I'm going to look at it from the side. So such that X goes this way, the thread thickness goes in, in the Z direction. The plate goes from, from plus h to minus h. And then I'm going to say, okay, well, this point here b moved to b prime and I'm out u uh, superscript uh, zero. And that is the deflection of the plate at b. So if I put z equals zero, what I get is that this goes away. And so the deflection point b it is really just a deflection u superscript zero. So there you go, it moves to this point. So then what is going on next is that the plate deformation is driven by the second term here. And so if I look at the slope at any other point, so say I have a slope of derivative of W with respect to X of that plate, uh, clearly the plate is tilted, okay? And you can see here that uh, this amount is derivative of W with respect to X. And so that does contribute to deflection in the negative direction, and you can see that that's occurring right there, as you see there. Okay, so at um, uh, as you can see, uh, when z equals minus h half, which is at the bottom of the plate here, and I, I know I realize I have it inverted, so z equals h half is top of the plate, z equals minus h half is bottom of the plate. If I put z equals minus h half into this equation, u gets augmented by the slope times that the the h half times that and you can see that here um, this deflection is a little bit greater when i look at point a prime so point a moved a little bit more to the right uh, likewise when we look at point c point c moved to the left 
respect to B prime. And so that makes sense, okay? So you can see here that I am able to track the plate behavior through a thickness if I just track the mid surface. And that will simplify the problem. And that's what we call this the classical plate theory. We've simplified the problem. And so, uh, sorry about that. So um, here you can see that the W equals W naught implies that the derivative uh, through a thickness direction of that deflection is zero, which is really the strain in that direction. So no thickness change implies no strain in that direction. So uh, using these assumptions that we made, uh, we can calculate the strains, the remaining three strains, because as you saw, this strain is zero and these strains are zero. This transverse is shear strains. And there are six components of strains. So I only have three to worry about, so that's epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma xy. Epsilon x, epsilon y, gamma xy are strains in the in-plane directions of the plate. Um, again, z represents the outer plane direction, x represents the in-plane direction. And as you see here, is when I substitute what epsilon x is, which is the derivative of u respect to x, I can plug this equation into that. And what I get is derivative of u respect to x, plus z times the second derivative of w respect to x, okay? So you also get that for epsilon y, if you switch x and y, you will see that. And then gamma xy, you also uh, can get something similar, okay? So these ones here are called the curvatures of the plate, and these are the mid-surface strains. When z is zero, you recover the mid-surface strains, and then anywhere else in the, through the thickness of the plate, you can get it by plugging values of Z. For, for example, if I wanna know what's going on at the top surface of the plate or the bottom surface of the plate, I'll plug in Z equals H half or minus H, H half, what, whatever or what we're looking for, okay? But uh, notice how we've simplified the problem so that the strains are dependent strictly of deflections which, which only are depend on the x, y coordinate system, and we have explicit, explicitly uh, factored out z so that all the quantities depends on x, y, and z. So we simplify the problem quite a bit by doing that. And so there you go. So we have uh, the strains can be broken down then into mid-surface strains and curvatures multiplied by z. And again, a lot of equations here, the important thing to understand is that the unknowns for this plate right now are u, v, and w at the mid-surface of the plate. Uh, while before, in contrast, you will have normally had, you will have not known u, v, and w, but for the whole plate. But now I, I don't know u, v, and w for the mid-surface of the plate. We, we simplified uh, the problem to tracking just the mid-surface. And by doing so, we have simplified um the problem a little bit more um and so as we continue here i will show you what's going on and what things do really mean so given the laminate uh you may have a strain variation uh and the strain variation is always going to look linear so as you can see here there is a strain through a thickness and the mid-surface strain plus z times the curvature this means that given the mid-surface strains given the curvature, the strain through a thickness is going to have a variation that looks like this, okay? Um, but if I have different plies and every ply has different lamina properties or modulus, then the stress is going to change as you go through a thickness, okay? So that's a, an important consideration to understand what is going on with the strain distribution through a thickness. It's a linear distribution is what we're assuming. And then the stresses could vary depending upon what the modulus uh, of each lamina is. If I have no curvatures, just stretching, meaning no curvatures, just stretching. So if I have no curvatures, then the strain doesn't matter where I am, it's the same as the one on the mid surface. So you're gonna have stretching of that plate. If 
In the other hand, I have no amount of stretching. I only have curvatures. Then the strain distribution through the thickness is going to look like this, okay? Um, and then in the other hand, if I have stretching plus curvature, just add this plus that, and it, it is going to generally look like this, okay? Um, so again, uh, it's important to understand what the strain is doing to the laminate. So we had previously discussed that there's three dimensional elasticity equations. There's three governing equations that describe that. And that was derived from um, Couch's relationship. We use a second Newton's law, but the integral form of that, we use the, 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 those two facts to come up with the equilibrium equations as you see them here. Uh, and we did that using the virtue of Gauss theorem. Um, and so note how all these deflections depend on X, Y, and Z, okay? All the deflections do. But for classical play theory, we were able to make it so that it depends just on X and Y. Just to remind you, here it is uh, what we've done. We have U, V, and W that depend on X, Y, and Z, but now we represented the deflection so that it's only a function of X and Y, and Z now is explicitly defined. So not only I have simplified having to find U, V, and W through the whole plate, and depending upon where I am, X, Y, and Z, now I have simplified the problem so I can find it. I only have to find the deflections at the mid-surface, and the, those deflections only depend on the X, Y, and X, Y coordinates within that mid-surface. So the question is, the, the, we had in 3D, uh, in 3D, we had these uh, equilibrium equations, and the question is, what does that look like for 2D? Because I made some significant assumptions, um, and those assumptions were that the normal remains perpendicular to mid-surface after deformation. That was assumption number one. And that the thickness direction of that plate is not gonna change very much. And we, we, we already discussed that those assumptions make sense for a thin plate. Uh, and we came up with those strain deflection relationships. The question is, how do I come up with the equilibrium equations that correspond to 2D? Because these are for 3D, okay? And um, in reality is that we need to find a way of getting these governing equations so they're consistent with the assumptions we already made. And so we need to come up with new stress quantities that really represent um, the behavior for the mid-surface of that plate. And, and they're able to measure those internal forces. Recall that stresses are quantities that are reacting external loads applied to the structure. And those stresses can be drawn on a cube representative. And we can, we can then uh, determine what stresses are reacting these external loads. But in, now that I have a 2D representation that I'm looking at, if I went back, the 2D representation becomes a little more complex. What does it mean for, for this problem where we're now just tracking the mid-surface? So feel free to pause the video and see if you have an idea of what you can do to come up with a 2D um, equilibrium equations. It's a little, a little trick, but I think once I show you the trick, you will say, wow, that's, that's what it was. Okay, now I gave you a moment to pause it. And if you did it, you're, I congratulate you for being the king of equilibrium equations. So here's what we're gonna do. We're going to take these equations and integrate these equations through a thickness. That is what we're gonna do. So, um, and by integrating these equations, we'll find that these 2D-like stress quantities will be compatible with the curvatures and midplane strains that we had previously discussed. So I'll go ahead and do that. I'm gonna integrate these three equations through the thickness, minus H half to H half dz, where H half minus H half is the bottom of the plate, H half is the top of the plate. When I do that, I'm going to distribute the integral into each of these stresses keeping the derivatives in the outside. You can see that here, we have accomplished that there. 
we've accomplished that there. But when I go to this particular term, I have the root of the sigma xz dz times dc. Well, that integral is really sigma xz evaluated at the top or bottom of the surface. I can then distribute that to the middle equation here. And all you have to do is switch x and y to get this bottom equation. And then finally, I have this third equation. I can integrate that through a thickness as well. And this third term, again, experiences this simple evaluation of top or bottom of the surface calculation. So right now, what I've done is converted the 3D equ equilibrium equations into 2D qu quantities by integrating through a thickness, OK? So these are, this, this right here that you see here uh, highlighted with a bracket, this right here is a type of stress, OK? There, there is still a stress. We just integrated the stress through the thickness. We've also done that with each of these terms. And you can see that here. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. And, and these are force resultants. We'll call them force resultants. Um, and if I look at the units, if stress is PSI, then these units are uh, stress, basically is basically force per unit length, okay? Force per unit length. Why is that? Because I integrated the stress through the thickness. And so now I have this quantity that's force per length, okay? So that's what we got there. These are, in fact, the quantities that react the external forces, but for a plate, not, not for the most general 3D, because for the most general 3D, it was a cube uh, with stresses drawn on the cube that reacted the external loads. But when I simplify the problem to 2D, it is this, in fact, these forces here, they are the ones that react those forces, the external forces. So now when I look at the plate in general, the top surface here, the top surface is very unlikely when to apply tangential forces to top surface. And so as a consequence, sigma xz and sigma yz will be zero at the top and bottom surface. However, very likely, just like in an aircraft, you, can, you may apply perpendicular loading to that surface, that will be pressures. And as a consequence, sigma cz, um, it is basically a pressure applied at the surface. Now we're only applied at the top surface, not the bottom one. So therefore, uh, you know, we only carry one of these guys, uh, sigma zz at evaluated h half equals p, because sigma zz at minus h half, there's no pressure applied on the other end. So the equations have indeed simplified into these two equations and this third equation. But we still have something missing here, and that's something related to bending, because these forces here, I'll show you later, but they really represent the in-plane forces, okay? The in-plane force quantity. So the idea then is to multiply by z, uh, and what we're going to do now is multiply by z, but these equations right here. So uh, each row will be multiplied by z, okay? And then we're going to integrate through a thickness to be able to get the bending behavior. So here it is. I multiply by z, integrate it through a thickness. And I did it for two of the equations. Um, and uh, what I want you to focus on is this term right here. This term right here. OK? So again, all we've done is taken the first two equations, these first two equations, multiplied by z, and then integrated through a thickness. And then I distributed the integrals into the integrand. And so I, I invite you to pause the video to kind of replicate what I've done. But here, what we have is this derivative, the integral from minus h half to h half z, times sigma z alpha dz. And so this x has become alpha. And if you look at this, we can integrate this by parts. And integration of parts will result 
uh, in this minus that, okay? And what we realize really quickly is that this is the shear force through the thickness. This quantity here becomes a shear force through the thickness. Um, and uh, that's also true for this case, okay? So this term is that, this term is that. We already told you that evaluating this at the top part of the surface or bottom part of the surface will give you zero. So this, this is not present anymore. Um, but this right here is Q. And so you can see here quickly that I found that this derivative altogether is Q. So then I have, for the first equation, I have that. For the second equation, I have that. And I want you to focus on this. This is the moment, okay? These are moments, right? And they have units of four somehow. But these are important quantities that are, these are the bending moments that resist the external loading condition. So I can now plug these uh, two equations into the third equation. So I had uh, this equation here, the third equation here, I can plug in Qx and Qy into this equation. And what I will find is that this is a governing equation, governing uh, moment resultants. Uh, so this plugs into here, this plugs into here, I get the moment resultant governing equation. And then I have these two equations, which are related to force resultants, okay? And we have defined already for you that nxx is the integral of minus h half h half sigma xx, ny is the integral of minus h half to h half sigma yy, nxy is the integral of minus h half to h half sigma xy, and likewise for the moment is the same as these uh, force resultants, but with the z multiplied by it. And so this is really what, what came down is this is the force resultant, this is a moment resultant, and what we want to do is relate this somehow to the strain relationships we had derived. Um, and to do that, it's going to take some work, it's going to take some thinking. Okay. We also want to understand the physical meaning of these uh, force resultants. So these stresses are the ones acting on the cube. What we've done is we've integrated these quantities through a thickness. And, and basically, uh, that will give me a 2D representation of what's going on because I eliminated Z out of the equation by integrating this through a thickness, okay? I did the same thing with the bending moment, uh, and so I get this. And so what is going on here? I want to show you exactly what's going on. So nxx here, this nxx is the integral of minus h half h half sigma xx dz. So I've integrated sigma xx, which is pointed on this surface, is pointed in the x direction. And by integrating this from minus h half to h half, I'm left with nxx, which is at the mid surface. Nyy, nxy the same way. Nyy is acting in the y direction. Nxy is acting in the shear direction, Ns. So Ns is the same as Nxy. This was from a different book. Uh, and then I have the bending moments that, that can be studied. Uh, and then bending moments will be Mxx, Nyy, and then torquing on that plate Mss, which is Mxy. You can see here by applying the bending moment, you, you're going to torque the plate. And also for Ms, uh, Mxy here in this ms. ms is the same as mxy also. And notice the units. The units are force per length, and the moment resultants are force per length per length. Okay, so again, uh, why is that? Because you're used to force being units of force, but it's, it's not really a force. It's a force resultant, because it's the stress really integrated through the thickness. And so how many quantities I have here? I have one, two, three, four, five, six. And so before I continue here, the thing I want to point out now is that um, this integral here from minus h half to h half um, needs to be broken up. So as you know, integrating from minus h half to h half can also be broken up in small integrals. Um, and so if I have a laminated plate 
that goes from minus h half to h half, and I have all these plies that go from k1 to kn, so n plies, laminated, the integral also can be written in this manner. Integral from, from k1 to n, summation of k1 to n, integral zk minus one to zk, this integral is equivalent to this integral. This integral looks more complicated. Sorry about that. Because we're trying to break up that integral into the integral between this point to this point, plus the integral between this point to this point, which is the same thing as the integral from this point all the way to this point. But we have to break it up. And the reason we have to break it up is because the modulus in every plate is changing and the angles are changing. And we want to be able to understand the overall effective behavior of this plate. So that is the approach to use to get there. Now, the, that's for the force resultants. For the moment resultants, very similarly, as you saw here, this integral of the stress quantities is multiplied by z. So these integrals will be broken up into small integrals um, that correspond to each ply. So the integral for that one ply, second ply, and so forth, and I have n plies. So that's why I have a summation here. And take an example, the second ply. The second ply goes from z1 to z2. So I'm going to have the integral from z1 to z2, calculate that, and add that onto the other integrals for the other plies. Uh, so that integral should be equal to this integral. Mathematically, they're the same. So again, I know this looks scary. I have this summation, I have this integral, but mathematically, um, there's nothing to be worried about uh, because we're talking about the same things. This is the same as that. We just broke it up because we have different, many different plies. So in classical play theory, we're utilizing, so, so now that I came up with this conclusion, I found the six stress resultants. Uh, these are the three force resultants and three moment resultants for a 2D plate. We have come up with the strain deflection relationships for a plate, uh, which again, those deflections only depend the deflections are only dependent on, depending on the x, y position at the mid surface. And that's the key there. We already found in, in classical plate theory, if the plate is thin enough, we can make the assumption that the outer plane stresses are zero. If the plate is too thick, then this is not the case. But for thin plates, this is not a bad assumption. Um, and why is that? Because the stresses through a thickness will not have um, will not build up enough to be a concern. And so for thin plates, uh, that's really all you have to worry about. It's a good assumption. So these three stresses become the ones that we need to worry about. So in cla the classical plate theory uses a constitutive law that we're going to simplify. So I want to focus then on the constitutive law now. So we already completed the idea of how to represent 3D stresses into 2D stresses or stresses corresponding to a plate. But now we have to relate the stresses and strain. And so uh, since these are the only stresses that matter, and this is the constitutive law for, for what we've done is simplify the constitutive law. This used to be a six uh, component vector with strains and six component stresses. Um, but we, since we've uh, uh, said that these three stresses are small and can be neglected, then the constitutive law can be simplified in this manner. So go back and look at uh, the previous video lecture where we talked about 3D constitutive law. And there, this was a six by six, uh, but here, because three of the stresses are zero, we can reduce the strain stress relationship in this manner. And so pretend, so this one, two, one, two, this, this, this correspond to the principal material orientations of the ply. So think of this stress strain relationship. And we talked about that. We, we talked about this stress strain relationship correspond to the principal material orientations. While the X, Y, and Z here correspond to the edges of the plate and the ply angles may not 
the, the one and two and three directions may not coincide with the X, Y, and Z. The triangles could be at some other angle relative to X, Y, and Z. So that's why it's important to really keep track of these uh, this different conventions going on. And uh, what we're going to do, we're going to invert this and put it in terms of stress. Um, so I can invert this fairly quickly. And uh, once you do that, I'm going to take this strain divided by two and put the two here. It's the same thing, uh, but that will allow me to do some coordinate transformations later on. So if I were to invert this in MATLAB or some code, what you will find is that Q11 is this, Q12 is this, Q22 is this. And as you know, these properties, these four properties come from the constitutive, uh, basically testing to inform the constitutive properties. And we had extensive discussions about how these properties can be found, but these are the properties you will find. Once you have these properties, you can calculate Q11, Q12, Q22, Q66. And what is interesting is that these numbers are the same for every ply if we're using the same material system. If you're using a hybrid material system, then you could have different values of Q11 depending, depending upon the material you're using. But for most applications for the same material system, these four um, Qs should be the same from ply to ply. And so when I go back here, what is really changing from ply to ply is the angle. And so now, my goal now is to somehow relate these stresses, which are stresses in a ply orientation uh, other than the X, Y, Z orientation. I want to relate these stresses here, X, 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 Sigma, Y, Y, Sigma, X, Y. These stresses, I want to relate them to the stresses in the principal material orientation. And so we can perform a coordinate transformation. And I've discussed extensively how to do that. Uh, but, but, but to summarize it for a, a um, for this redu reduced uh, second order tensor of stress and second order tensor for strain, um, we can transform it using this equation. And so alpha becomes the ply angle. Uh, again, if the ply angle is zero, then the cosine of zero is one. So this becomes one, that's zero, that's zero, that's zero, that's one, that's zero, that's zero, that's zero, that's one. So the stresses X, Y, and Z and tau X, Y, the shear, implant shear, these implant stresses become equal to the implant stresses in the principal material orientation. That makes sense because the angle is zero. Um, so I'm gonna, this is the way you transform it. We're gonna call, and you, 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 you can derive this using the form as discussed in class previously. So we're gonna call this T, T bold. So that's T bold. I can then um, also uh, transform the strain if I wanted to, and the strain will be equal to T bold uh, this strain. So if you know the strain uh, in the global orientation system, you can find the strain in the local material principle system. And the same for the stresses in the global orientation system. I can then calculate, but multiplying by T, I can calculate the stresses in the principal material orientations. And again, we're, th this M and N are cosine alpha and sine alpha. We're using M and N to simplify the writing these matrices and make it less messy. So given these relationships, I can then transform uh, this constitutive law and related to the global orientation system. So I know the stress in the principal material orientation system is T bold times the stress in the global orientation system. So that's that. And I know the strain in the material principal orientation can be related to the global strain with T bold that. And we just did that here. We showed you how to do that here. And so then all I have to do that then is to uh, pre-multiply by T inverse to get identity matrix here. So then now T inverse shows up here. And that's exactly what we saw. So as you saw, suddenly, miraculously, Q is defined the principal material orientation. But with these transformations, we're able to relate the stress 
in the global orientation system uh, and the strain in the global orientation system. So that, that's been able to, we've been able to accomplish that. Now, I, I can take this T bold, which was given here previously in this chart, and I, I encourage you to pause the video and kind of derive it yourself. Uh, so that's T bold. I'm gonna take that inverted, and I'm gonna take T bold there, and I won't multiply all of that. And so when you multiply all of that, typically in the books we're gonna find is that they're gonna call this matrix, they're gonna put Q11 bar like that. Uh, and so, if I were to expand Q11 bar, note that this is the same for every ply if I'm talking about the same material system. The only thing changing is the angles, so this one and this one. Uh, Q11 bar becomes that, and you can find all the Qs uh, that correspond to this matrix. So I'm able to then relate stress to strain using this matrix. Constitutive law. And note how Q11 bar and so forth can be found by multiplying all this stuff. And that Q11 is known and the ply angle is known. So you can relate, if you know the strain, you can relate it to, you can find the stress using this formula. Um, because this is a messy form, what people have done is make it a little bit easier to write it out. And it's actually useful for optimization. So Q11 bar can be written instead as U1 plus U2 plus cosine 2 theta plus U3 cosine 4 theta. And U1 and U2 and U3 are called invariants. Theta is the ply angle. Um, and so Q11 bar can be written in that manner. And note that Q11, Q22, Q12, and Q66 are fully known. So U1, U2, and U3 are the same for every ply. And so Q11 bar only depends on that angle and uh, all these numbers are known for every ply. All other stiffness quantity corresponding to these matrices, this matrix right here, are provided here for completeness. And notice how, um, again, it depends only on U1, U2, U3, U4, and U5. Um, and all these Qs are known for every ply. And so, in the, so Q11 bar and all these quantities only depend on the angle theta. So with that, now this looks very messy, but if you recall, the fourth resultant is NXX, NY, NXY, and that's a summation of these little integrals of every ply added, you're basically adding up the integrals of all these plies up, and that's why you have a summation symbol. Uh, but this equals as the integral minus h half to h half. The only problem is that stress varies from ply to ply because as you saw, the stress depends on the strain, but this is varying from ply to ply because of the angle change. And so that's why we have to be able, we have to integrate it in the manner that we're doing it, okay? So when I go here, I realize that this integral of, ply kth ply uh, has this, this sigma xy, sigma yy, sigma xx. This here is the Q bar matrix that we discussed times the strain matrix that we discussed earlier. And that's this. Are we done substitute a stress for that? Now notice that this strain is a strain through the thickness of the whole thing. But we found earlier in a, Welcome to pause the video and look at your notes. But we demonstrated that strain is equal to the mid surface strains plus Z times the curvature strains. So this is what we got there. And so um, I can go ahead now and integrate. So note that this, these quantities do not depend on Z at all. These curvature quantities don't depend on Z at all. So I can integrate none of these quantities here in this integral depend on Z, okay? These quantities are independent of Z. So that can come out of the integral. That integral only applies to these two, uh, these two terms. And so the integral of this becomes then ZK minus ZK minus one. And the integral of Z is basically Z squared over two, but evaluated 
at zk minus one and zk gives you one half zk squared minus zk minus one squared. And so that's essentially uh, your force resultant related now to the strains of the mid surface and the curvatures. And I need the constitutive law to be able to relate that uh, through. Okay. And nothing, notice that this force resultant has been in, is integrated through a thickness completely. Okay. We can rewrite it in different, this in different, since this is very messy, we can write it in a different way. Um, we can multiply this by this coefficient and um, call that the A matrix. So you can see here that multiplying these by ZK minus ZK minus one, this multiplication here uh, can be simply put as, as this summation here. So this summation here, so this times that, that summation there is this one here basically. And so uh, I can write this in this manner, A11, A12, A16, and so forth. And so that's your mid-surface strain. And then I have plus this summation, this multiplication times this coefficient here. And so that's that, basically, here at the bottom right. We call that the B matrix. This is called the A matrix. That's called the B matrix. And I can plug that in. And so then the force resultant simplifies to the A matrix times the mid surface strain plus B matrix times the uh, curvatures. Okay. So note now how bending of a plate, which will cause curvature, will then also cause in plane forces in that plate. That is no, not normally the case for an isotropic material this will go away for an isotropic material. And that's something that you could uh, prove through uh, working it out. Um, and so what we found here then is a relationship of force resultants to the quantities that we have talked about earlier. So let, let me back up and remind you a little bit of, of those relationships. So these are the six strain components. These are the mid-surface strains. These are the curvature strains. So we have six components of strain. And what we've done is related those to the forces, to the force resultants. There's three of them, OK? The A matrix can be quickly calculated you know uh, the location of each ply so you can calculate this quantity you know q bar for each ply so you can then do this calculation fairly simply with a simple excel sheet or a matlab code which you will be doing by the way um so let me on this let me explain to you what's going on so these are called the in-plane mid-surface strains these are the curvatures this matrix right here is called extensional stiffness this one right here is called the bending extensional coupling matrix. Um, and so uh, the internal force resultants can be found by calculating the A matrix and the B matrix. And the A and B matrix can be calculated if you know all the ply angles and the material properties. So these are fully known. These matrices are fully known. So this relationship can be uh, made. Now I want to go ahead and, and derive what it looks like for the moment uh, resultants. For the moment resultants, again, this stress is equal to Q bar times the strain. But I have a Z multiplied, so that's why I have a Z times the mid-surface strain plus Z squared times the curvatures. Now I apply the integral again onto the Z and the integral onto the Z squared and I get z squared divided by two, but evaluated from zk minus one to zk gets me to one half this quantity. And for the integral of z squared, I get z cubed over three. And again, that integral then gives me z cubed, z cubed minus zk minus one cubed. And so again, 
this is fully known for a reply. This location of the apply is known, so you can calculate that coefficient. And so you can readily calculate these coefficients. And for simplification purposes, you quickly see that this times this is we already calculated before. So this is exactly the same coefficient. And so this multiplication here times the one third is new, and that's your bending stiffness. Okay. So here you can see quickly that the moment is equal to the moment resultants is equal to, and again, this moment resultants and force resultants are the ones acting in your free body diagram, and these are the ones that react with external forces. As opposed to the typical stresses that you're used to, these are your new stress resultants that you want to focus on. And so given the mid-surface strains, given the curvatures, you can then, and you know all this uh, stiffness uh, because you know Q bar for every ply, you know the ply angle, you know the location of the ply. So these calculations should be fairly easy to, to compute. So you can then relate the moment resultants to the strain, um, mid-surface strains and the curvatures, which again are not dependent on the Z direction anymore. They only depend on the X, Y. That's why we're developing these 2D theories to simplify the need to go into 3D equations, okay? And so for the nomenclature, uh, this B matrix is called the bending extensional uncoupling. This one is called the bending stiffness uh, here. Um, and again, these are mid-surface strains and these are your curvature. I can put everything together. Um, so I have the uh, force resultant, the moment resultant, and it looks as simple as this. And, and it looks scary, but it's not that scary. What we've done is gone from 3D to 2D. Uh, these are the mid-surface strains. This is the curvatures. And the A, B, and D matrices, all these can be calculated because you know the apply angles. And you know uh, the properties of a reply. And so you can calculate then, uh, and you know the locations of reply. So these calculations are fairly straightforward. And with that information, this gets, becomes fully populated. For a given stacking sequence, for a given ply layout, you know A, B, and D. That's fully known. Now, let me go back and backtrack a little bit and remind you that the Q bar was calculated based on these U's. And these U's depend on Q, and Q is the same for every ply, as long as I have the same ply uh, material. Um, so it's only, Q bar only depends on the ply angle. That's all it depends on. So um, I can put everything to contracted notation for simplicity, uh, but uh, all I want to point out is that these two here are called the bending uh, extensional coupling. This is the extensional matrix. This is your bending matrix. And uh, why this is coupling is because when you look at the force resultant, the force resultant contains curvature terms. And it only contains curvature terms if the B matrix exists. The bending moment contains the curvature terms, but it also contains the stretching terms of the mid surface. And only it exists because of this B matrix that's here. And again, A, B, and D can be fully calculated for a given stacking sequence. Given the stacking sequence, A, B, and D are known, fully known. And these are all numbers. It looks messy here, but these are all numbers. And so uh, I want to use the governing equations of the plate because my ultimate goal is to figure out what are the governing equations for 2D. I know the governing equations for 3D. What are the governing equations for 2D? So I know the strains, which are as a function of deflection. So I can plug this in here. I know the curvatures. I can plug that here. Now I can take N and M, which are now in terms of U, V, and W. Uh, remember, these are deflections 
at the mid surface of the plate. Remember, I'm only tracking the mid surface. I no longer have to track the whole 3D plate because I've already integrated everything through the thickness. So I can get the combined effect of the through of the th whole thickness of the plate. And so now I'm wondering, now I'm trying to figure out how to solve this equation, how, how to put everything into a governing equation. So these strains can plug in here. These strains can plug in here, this coverage of strains. Plug all this uh, stress result, force resultants, and moment resultants, which are the stress resultants. We have the three governing equations. Plug all that in, and you get a mess. You get three equations that had u, v, and w as unknowns, um, in-plane lateral deflections and out-of-plane deflections. In this case, I'm including the pressure. So you have basically a plate subject to, to a pressure. Uh, so three equations and the three unknowns are u, v, and w. The boundary conditions of a particular problem are known. So as you can see, these are highly complex problems to solve. You're probably not, not going to do that by hand. You will do this through finite elements. And the boundary conditions typically are going to change depending upon what you're looking at. So for a plate uh, with simply, boundary, simply supported boundary conditions, which are basically rollers at each edge, you're going to have deflections are zero at those, at those edges. Um, for clamped plate, you're going to have a situation where the deflections are zero, but also the slope is zero. And here are some illustrations of very simply supported conditions you can have. So here uh, you can see a W0 in the thickness direction uh, because it's supported well and it's fixed to the ground. Uh, but you're allowing bending to occur at that pin. And you can see that U and V uh, are also zero. So there's no deflection in X and Y. You also have this type of simply supported beam where uh, you, you can roll in the X direction. So as a consequence, V is zero, which means that it cannot roll in the Y direction and it cannot move in the Z direction. But yet the bending moment and this load here are zero because nothing's resisting that motion. And likewise, I have this type of boundary condition, which is in the Y direction. It can roll in the Y direction, but it cannot move in the X direction. So as a consequence, V U is zero, V is free to move, W cannot move up and down, and um, you then have the final boundary condition that you could have, which is a roller in two directions. Yeah, you know, so you're used to seeing this for a beam, but for a plate it becomes a little more complicated. W is zero, so, uh, but then U and V are free to move, and then MX, NX, NXY, they're all zero because nothing is resisting the, the motion. So three governing equations, very messy to solve, and I'm not going to make you solve them. Um, it's not my goal. My goal is to try to explain to you what is going on, given the loading conditions they apply. So here's an external load apply, for example, the pressure. Given these boundary conditions that you may have, you have three equations, and the three unknowns are U, V, and W. And you should be able to solve for U, V, and W. Well, you shouldn't be able to solve it by hand but using maybe a finite element code. So what is the solution procedure when you go to finite elements? And so if I go to finite elements, what is that solution procedure? The finite element analysis, and I'm not gonna go into the theory of finite element analysis. If you're interested, go ahead and subscribe to my channel and I have a whole set of uh, finite element notes. Uh, but for this particular lecture, what is finite element analysis doing? We're discretizing the partial differential equations over the domain using small elements, smaller domain elements. You know, as you can see here, solving these equations, three equations look highly complex, but if I can try to solve it for smaller domain uh, elements, uh, I could get somewhere. And so uh, if I were to have a finite element mesh, the finite element analysis provides you the ability of applying loads to a structure, like an aircraft. And uh, when you apply all these loads, it can then solve for these deflections U, V, and W that I talked about. Um, and so it allows you to find 
those deflections in a way uh, that's straightforward. Closed form solutions can also be performed, and, and I may cover a few later, um, but the bottom line is that a finite element analysis is the approach that you will use to solve these equations. And so, given the loads and boundary conditions of the problem, what we really want to do is to de determine whether the structure I design can survive the loading environment. And so, what I want to be able to do is determine the laminar strains and stresses in each layer along the material principle directions because it's along those directions that really have the strength information, the strain to failure information that we had discussed earlier in time. And so um, given the, the loads applied to an aircraft or a plate or a spacecraft, um, I will then use these equations over the whole domain and solve these highly complex equations for U, V, and W, but use finite elements to do it. And the idea is then ultimately what I want to do is once I know U, V, and W, find out what are those strengths and stresses along the material principle directions, because that's where I have data for in terms of what's going to fail. So what is the solution procedure? Once I know U, V, and W uh, from these three equations, I can then plug it in here, U, V, and W. Okay, so I have U, V and that will give me the mid-surface strains. Once I know W, I know the curvature strains. So I have these three, so these six, I'm sorry. Once I know the mid-surface strains, once I know the mid-surface, the, the curvature, right? If I know the mid-surface strains and the curvatures, I can calculate the strains at any point through a thickness using uh, this equation, okay? And I know, uh, what is the strain at every ply? Uh, because I know the mid-surface strain, I know the curvatures, and I know the location of that ply, so I can calculate that mid-surface strain. Uh, once I know the mid-surface strain, I can then calculate, use the transformation equations we had previously discussed, and back engineer what is the strain along the material principle directions. Because this is really what you're going to use to calculate where uh, you know, the, 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 you're going to calculate whether you achieved failure, you achieved failure or not. Again, the transformation matrix was given this before and it varies upon what ply you're looking at. So that's why it's important that you track that this as well. This changes from ply to ply. So in other words, I saw for UV and W, and that's the same, UV and W is for the mid-surface of that plate, but yet I can get the 3D distribution through a thickness using this equation, right? So see how we've, we've simplified the problem. Otherwise, you will have very complex equation with partial Z and all that. We got rid of Z, and that's why there's a 2D plate theory, classical plate theory, to be more exact. And so once I've, uh, I calculate UV and W, Calculate the mid-surface strains and curvatures, which will be the same. That doesn't change. And now I have ply number 55. Well, find where that happens, where that Z occurs. What is the location of that ply? That's what Z is here is the location. Once I have that, then I have the strain for that particular ply in the global material, in the global system, right? And so once I have that, I can use a transformation matrix and get the strains but the transformation matrix corresponding to that ply, that ply angle, alpha, and then you can get the strains in the material principal directions, which are very useful to calculating, comparing against strain to failure data. But what's, what if you don't have strain to failure data? You still can take that information, plug it in to your constitutive matrix, Q times strain gives you the stress for that particular ply um, in the material principal direction. Um, I can also um, look at, so, so I'm, I'm able to find that, but you could do it uh, differently. You can calculate the strains first in the global, uh, in the global system, uh, plug that into this equation then, get stress in this way, and then 
transform stress to get stresses in the material principle orientation. So there's two ways of, to do it, uh, but this is uh, one way to do it. Uh, they want to show you here, but this one also works well. Okay. So let me go through and discuss what is going on when I specialize it for various laminates and uh, and I simplify it for various assumptions. Uh, I think that's worth covering at this point. So we'll look at uh, a generalized symmetric laminate. Uh, it's preferred for design, it's simple. Uh, and the nice thing about this type of design is that you get no coupling. So if you were to apply stretch into the plate, it won't bend as much. You're gonna have some bending typically because not, not everything is perfect. But what is a symmetric laminate is what, and I discussed the types of stacking sequences we can have. What I wanna do is connect that to what happens to the ABD matrices. And so when I talk about symmetric laminate, I talk about a minus 25 that's mirrored about the XY plane and you get it also on the other side. And you see that with the 35, the zero and the 90. Uh, as the number of ply increases, regardless whether you have a symmetric stacking sequence, if your ply plies increase, the number of them increase, this B matrix will approach zero. Okay, so that's another point I wanna make. Anti-symmetric laminates uh, are such that the top half mirrors, uh, but the angles are the negative, and you can see that here. Um, so you're gonna see that these quantities are zero, and these quantities will be zero. So they, there's no bending twist and no extensional shear coupling. So you don't have these, these components right here in the A and D matrices. And feel free to pause the video to study what's, what is going on. Um, and uh, I think you will see here that the, these two right here are not contributing to uh, the calculations of the uh, force resultants, and these two are not contributing to the uh, calculation of the moment resultant. You also have anti-symmetric cross ply laminates, so that's 90 and zeros, and you'll find that for those situations, most of these are zero, except for a few of this, okay? Angle ply and, and, and no 90 degree plies uh, are basically anti-symmetric angle ply laminates with no 90 degree plies. The top half mirror is a mirror image of the bottom half, except the ply angles are the negative of the bottom half, and there are no 90 degree plies. In those situations, these are zero, and these are zero. You also have balanced laminates where you may have a situation where a 30 degree ply also exists with the stacking sequence as a minus 30 degrees, it doesn't have to be symmetric or it doesn't have to be a mirror image. But you do find these situations. In those situations, you only get no extension shear coupling. Quasi-isotropic laminates are, are interesting laminates. Um, in the in-plane, uh, orientation that provide you isotropic behavior. And I already discussed quite a bit that quasi isotropic laminates may not always be the most suitable uh, ply stacking sequence because uh, you're gonna get isotropic properties in the in-plane direction. And the whole goal of using laminated composites is to ensure that uh, we are tailoring them to get the maximum performance we can for these types of uh, laminates. Um, so quasi-isotropic quasi laminates can be identified as zero plus minus 60, which is shown in the bottom left, zero plus 45, 90, which is here in the center, zero plus minus 60 plus minus 30, 90, that's this one here, or the plus minus 22.5 degrees, uh, plain we, for example, will have that. How can you identify whether you have a quasi-isotropic laminate? If in your stack sequence you have the same number of fibers going at an equal distance uh, angle. Uh, so here I will have like say you have three plus going that way, three plus going that way, three plus going that way, and so forth. 
then you have a quasi-isotropic laminate. And so that's going to give you an isotropic behavior in plane, and these two will be zero, and then these two will be zero for bending stiffness. We can uh, go through cylindrical bending strip theory to kind of illustrate what the solution of that would look like. Um, and you're going to encounter that sometimes. So in cylindrical bending strip theory, the derivative with respect to y vanishes. Out of all those equations I showed earlier, uh, which were quite complex, the three equations simplified to this for cylindrical bend bending. And uh, they look very similar to bending equations that you may have seen in school. For example, this equation should look familiar for mechanics and materials. This will be typically EI, W4 primes, and that's equal to the force applied. So that looks very similar to bending of a plate. Okay. And in fact, we can prove to you, and you, you should be able to demonstrate this, that D11 is basically 1 over 12 BH cubed times E. Uh, so you basically get the same uh, EI type term. Um, that you will have gotten through um, the equations from uh, mechanics and materials for beam under distributed loading. Here you have additional terms. And it's quite understandable because we have a more general formulation. Let me show you the solution, a, a simple practical solution, close from solution of a simply super, supported plate subject to, the, to loading. And the reason this is a good example is because we can actually solve it exactly. So this is a simply supported plate where uh, each edge is allowed to, 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 to rotate um, and is subjected to a uniform pressure. So if I look at a, um, uh, a laminated, laminated composite symmetric and balanced, so the, you know, there's no bending, stretching, and you don't get any B matrix, uh, then a lot of these terms go to zero. And so that I want to solve it for uh, a very simple problem, um, a symmetric balance laminate, so that we can actually solve it. So there is something called the Navier solution. Now, I don't want you to get stuck in the math, but understand that there are some solutions people have developed to solve equations like this one. And so one equation, one such equation is called, solution is called the Navier solution, which uh, assumes a summation series, infinite series um, for the deflection. And you, ha you have these coefficients that you need to find um, and sine alpha x, sine beta x, alpha is given by this MPA, uh, A is a, is a dimension of the plate, B is the other dimension of the plate, and M and N are being varied from one to infinity. Okay, so, so if you look at this carefully, A is known, M pi, and M pi is known. So all these things are known, um, and so I'm trying to find that coefficient. The beauty thing, the beauty thing, the beautiful thing about this is that it automatically satisfies the boundary conditions at x equals zero and y equals zero. We don't want the deflections to be, we want the deflections to be zero at the edges of this plate. Um, which is subject to, think of this plate subjected to pressure, right? So these edges are pinned and deflections out of plane are not possible. Well, uh, this does a good job. This solution satisfies that. And you can check that when x is zero, this is zero. So then all this is zero. And you can also see that when x is a, when x, x is a, uh, you have a, a there. A cancels A, so sine of M pi will give you zero. Uh, the moment um, are, are also zero at those uh, boundaries, which this would be zero because I'm not clamping it. And so you can also verify that I get moments to be equal to zero. Because I have second derivatives that need to be calculated, and the second derivative of sine gives me sine again. So when I evaluate sine at the edges of that plate, I also get zero again which is exactly what I need for a plate that's pinned, uh, is simply supported. Uh, so I, I, I don't have a moment at those edges as a consequence that will react the fact that's pinned. And so the transverse loading condition can be expressed as this. Um, if you look at a more advanced math book, 
uh, QMN can be given by that. So if I have a distributed load Q, that's, uh, you know, uh, a distributed load Q of some kind, it could be uniform, whatever it is. Uh, if it's uniform, then this is a very easy integral. Whatever it is, this QMN, this distributed load can be represented in this manner. And QMN uh, looks like this. Uh, for uniform load, you would put, let's say, one pound, one PSI, you would put one PSI there and integrate this. Um, then you can substitute uh, all, this Q here and this W here into this governing equation. And when you do that, you get this interesting equation. Okay. Now, for this equation to be true, the parenthesis the parenthetical has to be equal to zero. And so I can solve for WMN in this manner. And so what in fact I've done, I've solved for the deflection of the beam, because that's exactly what I was looking for, not the beam, but the plate. I'm able to find an expression for the, the WMN, which is the coefficient here. And so if I have that, I can now plot the deflections of that plate, very simply. Uh, note that any transverse loading can be expressed in this manner. For uniform loading, this turns to be, QMN turns to be a simple uh, form. For point load, it's going to look like this, and so forth. Bottom line is that once I know WMN, and I know W, the deflection, And note that this QMN is not the constitutive law. This is represented in loading environment. Once I know the deflections, since in this problem, we don't have any mid-surface strains because it's all bending that we're looking at, I find the deflections out of plane, which are given by this. And then I can look through what location of the through the thickness I want to find uh, the strains. Once I have that, I plug into the constitutive equations, and for a, a balanced symmetric laminate, these are zero, and so I get the stresses corresponding to that particular laminate. Not in, not in the material principle orientations, but in the global orientation. But I can, I can, in fact, find it for the material principle orientation by using the transformation matrices that we had discussed earlier. I can also solve simply supported plate on two opposing edges. Uh, here's an example of that. Uh, people have solved this type of, of problem in the past. Uh, you assume that these two edges are the ones simply supported. These two are free. That makes the solution a little bit more complex, but it can be done. And so let's examine this particular problem, which becomes a little bit more complex. So again, the same type of situation, sym symmetric balance, and so we're gonna, all these terms go to zero, so not in, not, we're not considering those. Um, but in this case, we're gonna use something called a Libby solution, and he chose the, for, the for, following form for this deflection. He said, okay, I'm gonna make W a function of X, so I don't know what that function is, but in the, in the Y direction, I'm gonna assume a sine function. And so that makes perfect sense, because if you look here, in the x direction, w may vary, and we don't know how that looks like. In the y direction, sign seems to be a good assumption. That will satisfy the boundary conditions. You can see that it's automatically satisfy the boundary conditions at y equals zero and y equals b. Uh, when y is zero, this goes to zero, and when b is zero, uh, when b y is b, b and b cancel out. Sine and pi gives you zero, and you can see there quickly that w is zero. You can also see that that makes sense because in this plate, these two edges are simply supported. I apologize. Uh, and now on the moments at those edges are also zero and you can see that this formulation also gives you this solution, this form of the solution also gives you that. And again, I'm not asking you to memorize these solutions because you're, you're not going to use them in the industry but what I'm trying to illustrate is how this, how loading on a plate plays out in a 2D type for, formulation. If this was 3D, if I did not make the simplification from 3D to 2D, I'll not be able to go through this process. 
So it was only because I made that simplification is that I can, I can solve these, these equations using plate theory. I can uh, uh, tr uh, uh, take any transverse loading and express it from this manner uh, where QN is this. Uh, you can substitute these expressions back into the governing equation right here. That's your governing equation. And once I plug it into the governing equation, for now I have this fourth order differential equation. And so now I can solve for WN, and that will be a fourth order governing equation you can solve. You use the boundary conditions to solve for WN. Uh, you can let Mathematica do that, wolframalpha.com, or a solver that gives you differential equations. But bottom line is you can solve for WN. And now you can just follow the same process we discussed before. Once I know WN, I know the deflection. Once I know the deflection, I can go ahead and calculate the curvatures. Once I know the curvatures, I can get the strains through a thickness at any point through a thickness at, at any ply. And then I can get the stresses in every ply. And if I want to get that in material principle orientation, transform them using the T matrix, the transformation matrix. So that explains how to uh, approach that. And now what I want to cover, so in the previous lecture, video lecture, we covered how to get the 3D effective laminate engineering constants. But now what I'm going to cover is how to get the 2D effective laminate engineering constants. Now this particular um, a part of a, a lecture is required in your homework. You're going to have to do this. And then compare against uh, uh, efunda.com, there's few websites that can uh, get the ABD matrices for you. So similar to 3D theory, sometimes it's convenient to calculate the effective engineering constants for 2D plate. Uh, this is a good idea to do if the laminate is symmetric. Uh, if not, then you're going to have some issues working it. Um, and so uh, if the laminate is not symmetric, um, then it may not work out as well. Since the laminate is symmetric, the B matrix is zero, and so the force resultant equals uh, the A matrix times the strain, the mid-surface strain. I can solve for the strain uh, in this manner, okay? And A star here is the inverse of A. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a little trick. I'm going to multiply by T every row and then divide by T on the N. And so if I do that, now N divided by T gives me the average stress in, in that particular ply for the X direction Y and XY. Because remember, N was integrated through a thickness, but I'm trying to get an average quantity there. So N divided by T times eight, times t, the t cancels out. That gives me exactly what I got here in the bottom right. But because the strain in the global orientation is this, the stress in the global orientation is this, I could say that the compliance, the compliance of the plate in the laminate coordinate system will have elastic constants that look like this. You could pretend that you have a material, like that block has a bunch of plies. Just assume that block is a particular material. And so that material has to follow a relationship like this. So all you have to do is compare this coefficient to that, this coefficient to that, this coefficient to that, and that's going to give you the modulus, but in the global orientation system. It essentially gives you, say you have a zero plus minus 40, 60, this EXX bar represents the modulus, the effective modulus in the X direction of the whole stack the same for the y and so forth. You can also get the Poisson ratio in quantities that look like Poisson ratio, but all they do is connect the stretch quantities with the shear quantities. So let's discuss a little bit uh, the thermal effects next. So how to account for thermal effects? So to account for thermal effects, um, composites generally solidify at a temperature much higher than room temperature. So when you cool down from cure to, cure, uh, to room temperature, cure is a point at which the structure solidifies. The room temperature, it will lead to residual stresses caused by the differential thermal contraction between layers. 
The operational stresses at temperature colder than room temperature can increase the thermal stresses. So it's important to understand that if you have cooler temperatures even, then the thermal stresses will increase. How do you account for that? So thermal expansion is a material property that governs the behavior of the material during uh, thermal loading. And um, I apologize for that. Um, and so the stress strain relationship um, is given by this. So, but now we're including the expansions, um, the coefficient of thermal expansion. Um, and we're gonna take the reference temperature as the temperature at which the composite solidifies for the uh, reference temperature. So we can apply the same transformations we talked about before to, come, to transform strain to stress, but bring that into the global orientation system. And so this is what we get for that. Um, the alphas here, these alphas can be also transformed using this relationship um, here. So you can just use these formulas and you'll be fine. So alpha in the global orientation system can be related to the alphas in the principal orientation system. You get this weird alpha xy that shows up, but it's important to consider. Okay, so once you have alphas, that can be plugged in here, and now you have, you're ready to go. So the lamina stress resultants, again, use the same formula we had before for the force resultants, uh, but now that integral is broken up into all these plies just like before, but now the stress, right? Not only you get the stress equals Q times the strain, but now you have the strain we had before, but now we have to account for the coefficient of thermal expansion that we had discussed previously. So this is a new term that this, this column vector you had not seen before. And so uh, again, I can multiply everything out, but the new term here is this, this matrix multiplied by this here, this is new. So that's your uh, force resultant due to thermal stresses. Okay, so this purely caused by thermal stresses alone. Hence, uh, very similarly, if you do it for the moment, you're going to get something like this. So hence, you're going to get the force resultant and the moment resultant to be the matrix we had before minus the force and moment resultants caused by these thermal stresses, the thermal environments, I'm sorry. And you can see that, that from here. So we can also define an effective uh, coefficient of thermal expansion. You can do that too uh, by using the laminate midplane as follows. So you, you can say, okay, this is my effective uh, coefficient of thermal expansion times delta T. That's that's your mid surface strains, okay. And for sy symmetric laminate, uh, and only considering in-plane thermal forces and no mechanical forces. Uh, so just in-plane forces, no mechanical forces, then your thermal uh, force resultants become this quantity here. Okay, so nothing has really changed from what we discussed. And so then you can calculate uh, the, you can calculate the, you can substitute the mid-plane strains as we discussed before. So that's this term right here can be incorporated into this column vector, right? Because if the mechanical forces are zero, so that's this column, then in the B matrix is zero, then I can solve for N. And so N is A times this column vector. This column vector times is equal to delta T times this effective coefficient thermal expansion, which I'm trying to find. And I make that equal to this because epsilon is this is uh, was found to be that. And so uh, for if I assume a uniform temperature through a thickness, we can solve for the effective coefficient 
of thermal expansion. I can do that. So uh, for uniform uh, temperature, then it can solve for that by inverting this matrix. Okay, and delta T cancels out. So inverting that gives me this quantity, and now I can get the effective coefficient of thermal expansion for the whole stack using this formula. So given the coefficient of thermal expansion for a reply that's transformed in the global orientation, multiplied by the Q matrix, multiplied by the A matrix inverse gives me the effective coefficient of thermal expansion of the whole stack. Hydrothermal effects can also be included. Um, hydrothermal effects are moisture effects where it causes the composite to swell um, and causes, it can cause strains and stresses in the plies. So moisture absor absorption, by the way, can cause reduction in strength, just like the thermal can. And the coefficient of thermal, uh, the moisture expansion is usually in the indicated as beta, similar to alpha. And the coefficient of, and the moisture concentration is usually called a, a C. So similarly to the thermal expansion transformations, this is what you get for the moisture expansion transformations. The hydrothermal force resultant uh, becomes this. And so um, this is what you will get. Uh, the hydrothermal moment resultant will become this. Uh, and it's important to note that these are caused by the concentration of moisture. Beta is known, that is a measured quantity. So these two things alone will cause this NNM to occur. And so then uh, if you include thermal and hydrothermal effects, these quantities will be fully known. And uh, in the finite element modeling, you can apply all these thermal and moisture conditions and mechanical loads, and then determine the deflections and from the deflections again you can uh, and you can then solve for the apply stresses and strains as we discussed earlier an example so the solution procedure is uh, provide a stacking sequence of the lamina the lamina engineering constants and the cure temperature determine we want to find out the residual stresses in each ply at room temperature so given the cure temperature what is going on a residual at at room temperature. So obviously, because I cured it at, at a hotter temperature, when I cool it down to room temperature, residual stress will appear. The first step is to calculate the ABD matrices for the whole laminate. So you get the whole thing. Once you get the whole thing, uh, you can, there's no hydrothermal effects here, so don't worry about that. Uh, there's no mechanical load in this case, so you can ignore that. Uh, I can now calculate uh, the uh, coefficient uh, of thermal expansion in the global coordinate system, and that depends on the ply angle. Okay, so that depends on the ply angle. Alpha 1 and alpha 2 are in the material principal orientations. Uh, and so once you have this information and you have delta T, you can then calculate the, the force and moment resultants due to the thermal loading that was applied. So this is zero, this is known, and this is known. So you can solve for the mid-surface strains and the curvatures. Once you determine these mid-surface strains and curvatures, you have the coefficient of thermal expansion sum to delta T, calculate the strains in each layer, and the strength in each layer then is used to calculate the stresses in each layer in the global orientation system. And then from there, you can transform this to get the stresses in the principal orientation system, material principal coordinate systems. You can also do that with the strain. You can uh, transform the strains from the global to the local orientation system. And here's some typical material properties that you can find for various uh, material systems. Uh, feel free to pause the video and look at this carefully. But I hope through this video lecture, in summary, what we've done, we've learned how to take a 3D problem uh, and use classical plate theory, which is making fundamental assumptions about uh, assuming that the plate will be thin, 
uh, that if I were to make a thing, I can just track the mid surface. And if I can find, if, can, if I can solve for the deflection of the mid surface, then I can solve uh, for the ply stresses and strains, which are important to determine whether the structure will fail or not. That's how you will size it, right? You want to size it to make sure you're not failing the structure. So uh, I thank you very much for, for following this. I, I hope they enjoy the show, that you can take a little bit of, 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 of uh, a self-study and go through all these materials on your own one more time. And, and I ask you that you, you spend that time very carefully. And uh, I'll see you next time. And have a great time and stay safe.